What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 29 of Breaking Bats, presented by Not For Long Media. I'm your host, Justin Ayers, and it's just me this week. Uh, we wish Brian the best. He'll be back next week, uh, so we wish him the best and everything he has going on over there in Japan. But I have a lot of really, really cool stuff planned for you guys this week, including an interview with Sean Anderson. He's a pitcher in the Toronto Blue Jays system, had a couple great seasons in San Francisco, bounced around a little bit last year. We did about a 45-minute conversation Really, really cool stuff. It was really cool getting his perspective on things, and I can't wait to have him back on the podcast when BOG gets back. Hopefully in the fall, uh, we'll have uh, Sean Anderson back on, so that's going to be really, really cool. Uh, But before we get to all of that this week, uh, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Som Sleep. Are you having trouble getting enough sleep at night? Som Sleep has you covered. The scientifically advanced Som snack includes ingredients that are naturally found in your body like GABA, magnesium, and melatonin. Sleep is the best form of recovery, and it's helped people everywhere take their game to the next level. It's simple. All you have to do is drink one serving 30 minutes before you go to bed, and your body will naturally calm itself down. Other sleep supplements leave you feeling groggy in the morning, but not Psalm Sleep. Wake up feeling refreshed and ready to conquer the day. Go to GetSom.com, click shop, and enter the code BATS at checkout. That's B-A-T-S at checkout for 10% off your entire order of Psalm Sleep. All right, for the news this week, we're going to be split into two categories, what I liked and what I didn't like. First, with what I liked. I really liked Corbin Carroll's performance in the last couple days in Arizona. So Corbin Carroll is the Diamondbacks' top prospect. I believe he's number three overall, according to MLB Pipeline. Uh, he's a center fielder. He's been he's been playing the corners now in Arizona. But so to take it back, he was the 16th overall pick in the 2019 MLB draft. This guy's absolutely crushed it every time he's been in the minor leagues. Legit five tool player. I was looking at his stats just this season in 2022, split between, I think, double and triple A. This guy hit 24 home runs, batted 307, had a 425 on base, and he stole 31 bags. So uh, this guy has it all, and he also gives hope to every skinny dude out there. Because if you've seen Corbin Carroll at all, he's 5'10", 165, and 165 might be generous because his jersey sleeves swallow his arms. So, uh, you know, gives hope to every guy like me out there who has trouble putting weight on and keeping it on. Maybe I can be like Corbin Carroll one day. But uh, this guy is awesome. So his major league debut came on the 29th, and it actually came on the date that the Diamondbacks rallied from seven runs down to beat the Phillies 13-7. to the, It was the largest comeback in franchise history, and it's the first time this season that the Diamondbacks scored six runs in back-to-back. It's the first time this season any team has scored six runs in back-to-back innings. Uh, so Arizona is red hot right now. It's not a team you would think normally think about. Um, I don't think I've ever met a Diamondbacks fan, but th- this team is so much fun to watch. Um, but Corbin Carroll, going back to him for a second, he might possibly be the fastest guy in the majors. He was clocked running the bases last night on Tuesday, 31 and a half feet per second, which I think any, any foot per second over 30, that's elite. So elite speed from Corbin Carroll running the bases. And another fun fact, his five RBIs in his first two games are the most by any player in Arizona Diamondbacks history. So everything this guy's doing is electric. I encourage you guys to check him out. You know, check out a Diamondbacks game if you're interested. Maybe you got the MLB.com, uh, MLB.tv app. Check out a Diamondbacks game. These guys are a lot of fun to watch right now. They have a lot of very young, dynamic talent. So that is what I liked. Here's what I didn't like. And I'm really sorry to all the San Diego Padres fans out there. It has to do with Josh Hader. The numbers for new Padres reliever Josh Hader have not been great. Uh, He's allowed 28 earned runs in his last 21 innings pitched. And before that, he had zero earned runs in his previous 38 innings. So uh, there's going to be a lot of stats here about Josh Hader that, you know, if you're a Padres fan, maybe hit the 30-second skip ahead button because it's not going to be pretty. Um, And Josh Hader's previous two and a half seasons combined, that's 2020 to June 6, 2022, uh, he allowed 16 earned runs. And he had 28 in the last 21 innings. So um, it's not been pretty. On Sunday, Hader was brought in for the bottom of the eighth against the Royals. The Padres were down 9-6. to six. You think, okay, that's a low leverage situation. Let's get this guy back on track. Let's. It's like in basketball. You just got to see the ball go through the hoop a couple times. That's all we're trying to do. We just got to get Hader out there, and we got to get him back on track. Uh, he then allowed six earned runs in one-third of an inning. So I don't know what it is. I, I, I'm not... You know, I wish Brian was here to maybe help me break down, like, you know, maybe the more of the intricacies of, of Josh Hader's struggles right now. But I'm looking at it from a fan's perspective, and I'm questioning if he's still the best relief pitcher in baseball. There was, you know, a slam dunk home run answer of that was always Josh Hader for the last couple of years. It's like, oh, 
Josh Hader. This guy's electric. Everything he does, he strikes everybody out. He has like a bajillion strikeouts per nine. It's not looking like he's the best relief pitcher in baseball anymore for whatever reason. Maybe that's mental. Um, maybe that's, you know, he's tipping his pitches. I, whatever it is, uh, this guy's getting hit around and he's getting hit around hard. Um, I look at maybe an Emmanuel Classe for the Cleveland Guardians. Uh, I, he, his numbers this season have been, he leads the league in saves with 30. He has a 1.15 ERA. So maybe maybe a guy like Class A will have to will have to assume the mantle of the best relief pitcher in baseball here with Hater struggling. And it really sucks for Padres fans too because they had a good closer before this in Taylor Rogers, and then they traded him to Milwaukee, who doesn't even let him close games consistently anymore with Devin Williams over there. So it's like, all right, we got rid of the good, let's upgrade to great, and then for, instead of going from good to great, you went from good to very bad. So uh, it's it's not been pretty. So. Uh, you know, let's hope our guy Josh Hader can turn it around. For for the sake of all the Padres fans listening to this, I hope he does. So that is what I liked and what I didn't like from the past couple days around the league. Uh, next up for you guys, we have the fudging awesome moment of the week. And that is, of course, brought to you by our sponsor, the Original Fudge Kitchen. The Original Fudge Kitchen is a staple of the Jersey Shore with six locations in Cape May, Wildwood, North Wildwood, Stone Harbor, and Ocean City that make all of their fudge in store, guaranteeing a delicious product. So stop by and let them know that we sent you if you're on the Jersey Shore. We have like one good weekend of summer left. We got Labor Day weekend coming up. We have to get after it one last time uh, before fall comes. But if you aren't able to visit the Original Fudge Kitchen in person, uh, they ship fudge and sweet treats all across the country. So go check them out at fudgekitchenswithans.com. That is fudgekitchens.com. The original Fudge Kitchen shipping fudge and sweet treats all across the country. So our fudging awesome moment of the week this week, it goes out to our guy, Nathaniel Lowe. Nathaniel Lowe of the Texas Rangers has gone nuclear with his production uh, the month of August and really the second half of this season post-All-Star break. So he was recently named the AL Player of the Week. That's because he batted, get, get this, 385 with four home runs and 11 RBIs in a week. So Nathaniel Lowe, check him out. Like everything this guy hits is like dead center. It's like 430 feet off the bat. He just has so much raw power. And I have a bunch of really, really fun Nathaniel Lowe stats for you. Uh, so he's slashing 392, 446, and 657 in the month of August. He's currently batting 298, 22 homers, and 65 RBIs on the year. He's fourth in all of Major League Baseball in weighted runs created plus since the All-Star break. And like I said, everything I feel like this guy hits is like dead center. And he has the most hits up the middle or to the opposite field this season. He has 102, and Freddie Freeman is the only guy in the Major Leagues who has more than him with 109. So uh, I love... Every day I look on Twitter, I feel like Nathaniel Lowe hits a home run. If you follow us at Breaking Bats Pod on Twitter, I do my best to try to put every Nathaniel Lowe homer up on our Twitter account because it's so much fun following this guy. And also shout out Nathaniel Lowe because you're carrying my fantasy team right now. My fantasy baseball team is, is being led in part to the production of uh, Nathaniel Lowe. So I just want to give a shout out to him for that. So uh, yes, fudging awesome moment of the week. AL player of the week, Nathaniel Lowe. All right, last up for you guys, before we get to the Sean Anderson interview, uh, instead of a top five, we're going to be doing a starting five. We're going to be doing a starting five of baseball players if we had to create a basketball starting five with them. Uh, so the, the only you know stipulations for this one were that they're active players, and I tried to make it true to form with an actual basketball you know starting five in terms of height, speed, you know ability. So I'll start us off with my point guard. It's Trey Turner of your Los Angeles Dodgers. So he's 6'2". Great hands, obviously turning that you know, double plays at shortstop. But my favorite part about having Trey Turner running the point is he can run the floor with the best of them. Uh, we just talked about Corbin Carroll's elite foot speed, but Trey Turner is also right up there and has been for probably half a decade. He's probably led the base, Major League Baseball in, in sprint speed and foot speed. So I would feel very confident having Trey Turner uh, run point for me. So shout out NC State and Trey Turner. Uh, my shooting guard, my two guard, Julio Rodriguez, he's 6'3". I'm looking at Julio Rodriguez as the all-around athlete, as the guy who can sprint with the best of them, who can, you know, shoot the ball consistently, probably. I have no idea of knowing if he's good at basketball or not. But for the purposes of our starting five, he's going to be my two guard. And my next pick for my small forward is my favorite pick of the entire top five starting five. It's O'Neal Cruz of the Pittsburgh Pirates. So this guy's 6'7". He's slender. He's fast as hell. And I'm looking at that length, 
He can defend one through five. Every position on the floor, O'Neal Cruz can defend. He can get a hand in your face, block shots, you know, run the floor. It's it's everything you want in a small forward, and O'Neal Cruz brings that. So he's he's my no, he's my three in the four spot. My power forward, and there's a lot of power in this guy, Aaron Judge. Banger down low, like six seven. I think he's like two eighty five. Like he will box your ass out for a rebound, like it's nobody's business. And he he will use his size and intimidating force to just dominate at both ends of the floor. So Aaron Judge at the four spot, I feel really confident about. And last but not least, my center. It's uh, I don't think he's I think he might be in the minors right now. But I remember when he made his debut this year, and it was hilarious watching him him move. It's Sean Jelly. Of the San Francisco Giants. Uh, I think I might have pronounced that last name correctly. Uh, but this guy's 6'11. I thought he was seven foot for a minute, but yeah, he's I guess he's you know technically 6'11. Great mustache, very intimidating mustache for a center. Uh, so that is my that is my starting five. Just to recap for you one more time. At the point, Trey Turner, at the two guard, Julio Rodriguez, my small forward, O'Neal Cruz, my power forward, Aaron Judge, and my center, Sean Jelly. Um, I think that that's a dominant starting five. And I think if we were to compete in the actual NBA, we'd probably do better than my, my Washington wizards, if we're going to be honest. So, uh, that is, that is our starting five top five for the week. And I talked about him earlier in this interview, but, uh, our interview for this week is with Sean Anderson, just an awesome guy, uh, wishing him the best. He, he, like I said, he's currently in the Toronto blue Jays system, you know, starter reliever. He talked about being in that hybrid kind of role. And it was really, really cool. And, and I'm glad I got the opportunity to talk to him. And like I said, I, I hope we can get him back on the podcast when Brian's on here. Because uh, I think, you know, those guys swapping stories about playing together in San Diego, I think that would be that would be must-see podcasting. So without further ado, uh, we're going to send this over to the interview uh, with Sean Anderson. Enjoy. All right. Joining us now on Breaking Bats, we have a pitcher for the Toronto Blue Jays, Sean Anderson. Uh, Sean, how are we doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Justin. Yeah, dude. So uh, I was going back and I was looking, and I really would have liked to have had Brian here because I think did you guys run into each other in San Diego last year? Yeah, we played in San Diego a little bit and then a little bit in El Paso uh, towards the end of the year last year. What What do you remember about playing with uh, with old Bog? <laughs> he could definitely hit the ball a long way, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I was only with San Diego about maybe a month or so, but uh, but yeah, he was good to have in the clubhouse. Yeah, absolutely. That that we'll, we'll we'll talk about that 2021 because they had a lot going on last year. Um, but I want to take it back. So I was going back and I was looking. So did you go to the same high school that Hosmer did in South Florida? I did. Yeah, yeah. I went. Uh, Eric Hosmer, Devin Marrero went there, um, and those are the guys I trained with in the off season as well. That's fantastic. So I mean, that area feels like it must have a ton of competition. So like, what was it like growing up playing with that high level of competition back then? I feel like South Florida has always had just, like you said, a high level competition, I think because of the weather, you know, it's hot year round and you don't really get any like snow or, or cold weather to where you can't play. And that's kind of what I enjoyed growing up in Florida. And I hope I stay in Florida most of my life. Um, uh, as far as the competition, you know, high school, high school was good. It was, I mean, a couple powerhouse schools around. I went to American Heritage. Um, but teams in Miami, teams in uh, Central Florida were always pretty good. I ended up going to the University of Florida, and uh, even the teams like in Florida, the college teams were pretty good too. Um, I think just the weather has most to do with it. I know California has some good teams too, and I think the weather contributes to most of that. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're big Eric Cosmer guys on this podcast. We had him on a while ago. We're, uh, you know, probably we're, we're, we're carrying the torch for the Eric Cosmer fan base here. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, how cool is that guy? I mean, he can do no wrong, right? Yeah, no, he's, uh, I've been training with him since I first got into high school and he's kind of been a mentor for me in a bit. Um, just kind of the work. Same trainer, uh, Scott Forsman over at BioCore and Davey and, uh, just kind of coming up with him. He was, he was a lot older than I was, but, uh, he still was, I mean, first rounder, you know, and, uh, all the success that he had with Kansas city. It was just, it was cool to pick his brain about it, you know, and winning the world series and what that was like. And just at the end of the day, it all came down to the work that you put in was definitely worth it. And uh, just the drive to make it to the big leagues and just kind of having that, 
having that guy to talk to about that kind of stuff made a difference, you know, coming out of uh, high school and then college and just knowing what the path was. Absolutely. I mean, he seems like he has like an infectious personality and also kind of like that drive to, to succeed and that drive to win. Um, you know, I mean, I'm sure training and being around him, that, that just must be an awesome experience. Um, I, I was going back and I was looking. So I was, did you not play other sports in high school because you were concerned about injuries? Was that a thing back then? Uh, yeah, actually, that's, that's funny you say that. So I went to American Heritage is a private school. And, uh, you know, I was, always, I was always interested in like football and basketball just because of my size. But uh, my passion was always baseball. And when I went to when I went to high school, I, I considered the other sports just because some of the other baseball players were were playing football. But I mean, we had one pitcher that jammed his finger um, on the line and then he couldn't play for the high school season. And I was like, all right, well, that's the sign. I, I can't play any other sports because if if I can't play baseball, I mean, that's what I'm going there for. And that's that's what I want to do. So um, I really just trained um, instead of playing other sports and um, really got addicted to training, you know, training and the whole nutrition behind it. Um, and that's always been my passion since high school. That's really interesting. I mean, we, we had Josh Booty, the, the multi-sport football baseball athlete on last week, and he talked so much about, you know, the value of playing multiple sports. But, you know, that's interesting to hear your perspective playing just one. Do you think that being able to focus in on one and devote all your time helped you more so than if you would have played multiple? Um, I actually really condone playing multiple sports. I think being athletic is the most important thing you can do for baseball. Um, whether, I mean, any sport, but for me, because of the injury factor, I reverted into just working out and training and I fell in love with training and I learned about the body more. I wanted to study it more. And, um, I think you can go both ways with it. Um, I do, I would say playing multiple sports is, is awesome, especially in high school. Um, but then obviously going into college, I think you need to focus more on one, but I'm happy the route that I took just because, I mean, I, I really do love training and, and nutrition, like I said, and I think everyone's got their own routes, but I'm happy with the one I took for sure. Absolutely. So, I mean, you know, obviously we're talking about your great high school baseball success, I saw an interesting little nugget. So the Nationals took you in the 40th round in 2013, but it wasn't just any pick in the 40th round. It was MLB.com's Don't Count Them Out Award for the very last pick in the draft. Like when you got the call that they were taking you the very last player, were you like, what were your emotions? Were you like happy to be taken, but also kind of like, wait, what? Yeah, that that was interesting. It's funny because, I mean, I went to all the showcases and, and everything that all those guys go to in high school and, um, after the kind of fourth round, uh, went by, I was like, all right, well, I'm not getting drafted. I'm going to go to school, uh, because that was kind of my leeway of whether I was going to take the draft or not. And then I was watching the draft a little bit, um, just kind of following the tracker. And then as soon as I got to like the 39th round, I was like, all right, like, it's all good. Like, I know I'm not getting drafted. And, um, I ended up getting a bunch of text messages like, oh, congratulations. Like, and I'm like, Oh, you guys are just like messing with me, you know? And then I got a call like an hour later from the nationals that said that they had drafted me. And uh, I was just like, what? Because it was almost like uh, they didn't call me and tell me they were drafting me. I got drafted and they called me a couple, couple hours later. Um, so it was kind of cool just, just to get drafted in general. Um, although I probably wasn't going to sign at that, at that level, considering I was going to the university of Florida um, but I mean, the nationals will always have a place in my career, you know, because of, because of that. And, uh, yeah, I got the mystery relevant or whatever it's called. It was interesting. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad it's so funny that they put a different name on it instead of Mr. Irrelevant. It's like, Hey, don't count this guy out. You know, yeah, just because yeah. he's the 1216th pick overall, that doesn't mean what, what was like, did you find out the details of what that would have looked like if you would have signed that as the Mr. Irrelevant kind of situation? Yeah, it was uh, – I don't even think they have 40 rounds anymore. But it was uh, – they called me and they're like, hey, we'd love to follow you around um, this summer, you know, and see if see if maybe we can make you an offer. And I was like, you know what, to be honest, I'm going to go to University of Florida in the summer and I'm going to take some classes. I'm not even going to play. Um, but I think I'm going to just commit to the University of Florida and, and go there because uh, I couldn't imagine they were going to go over slot in the 40th round, whatever I wanted to take me out of going to the University of Florida. So 
I respectfully declined and they uh, just sent me this paper to sign and uh, just <laughs> went off to the University of Florida. But it was cool to get drafted. You know, it's always yeah. it's always the drive in high school. And uh, I mean, that's what you're playing for. You, you want to get drafted. But <clears throat> with uh, with my career going towards the University of Florida, that was hard to turn it down. What would it what would it have taken for you to not go to the University of Florida? Would that have been like a higher round draft pick, a lot of, you know, slot money thrown at your way? Like what would that have looked like, you think? Yeah, coming out of high school, I had uh I had talked with uh during my family. It was like what what was the number that was gonna take to get me away from going to the University of Florida? And after it passed like the third or fourth round, I was like, all right, all these slot value. And, and the way it is now, it's like you're slotted for what you're going to get. You know, you can get a couple mil over or whatever um, in the higher rounds. But in the 40th round, I couldn't imagine that it was going to match up to what my number was to take me out. When you look back at your time at the University of Florida, like how do you remember it all? Um, it was definitely a maturing factor. Um, you definitely learned how to win, you know, being at the university of Florida with Kevin O'Sullivan, the main priority is winning. There is nothing else. So, um, there was a little bit of development, but at the end of the day, you were winning and you're playing in the sec. So the competition level was the highest you can be in college. So, um, I think I really learned how to first off manage my time as far as classes and schedules like that. But as far as like taking a hundred ground balls every day as a pitcher, hitting fungos every day for an hour, like the little stuff that just like what it takes to win and fielding your position, throwing strikes. And they just have such a good setup there at the university of Florida, such set you up for success. And uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is a hard nosed coach as it gets, you know, and um, if you show any sign of weakness or any sign of uh, not winning mentality, he'll let you know about it. And he's very outspoken about that. And, uh, the things I've heard at the University of Florida, I couldn't hear anything in my professional career that wouldn't match up to that. So it's kind of built me this this hard skin to now kind of pro ball is just development, obviously, in the minors and then win in the big leagues and obviously in AAA. But taking care of winning has always been the number one factor. And, I mean, you can say that at any team that that's what they want is a winning player. So I think that's the that's the mentality I built at the University of Florida was was learning how to win. It just also feels like a great program for developing major league talent. Like I was going back and I was looking at th- some of those rosters and just like the, the quality of major league player that came out of that university. It, it's insane. Um, but going back to you for a second, like, you know, I think, did you start as a starting pitcher and then get transitioned to a closer? What, what did that all look like? Yeah. So yeah. I mean, my, my recruiting class was crazy as far as depth and in, in the draft and big league players now, but um, coming out of high school, I was a starter. And then when I went into college, the amount of talent we had there, there wasn't really any room to start. So freshman year, I had up and down year, um, double throwing strikes. Second year, kind of the same thing. And then going into going into my junior year, I knew I kind of had to figure something out. So I uh, developed uh, like a cutter slider hybrid thing and then just uh, like a two seam to play off that. And just started throwing harder. And the first two series went well and kind of forced the hand. It was like, I think we played Missouri um, like the third weekend or something. And I went uh, save, win, save, back to back to back. And then after that, kind of solidified, my, solidified myself as earning the, the closer role in my junior year. And I kind of just took it and ran with it. Ended up having a really good breakout junior year. And then uh, as far as the scouts go, uh, going into draft day, I was like, Hey, if you're going to draft me, I want to start and I want the opportunity to start. And, uh, the Red Sox actually respected that. And they drafted me in the third round and, uh, told me I could start and then went up through my whole minor league career as a starter. And I ended up starting in 2019 for, uh, the San Francisco giants. I ended up getting traded, um, halfway through my minor league career. Um, but yeah, um <clears throat> started for the San Francisco Giants most of 19 ended up getting two closing opportunities towards the end of the year in, in 19 so that was pretty cool so um I've kind of just throughout my whole career felt like I can start close come out of the pen and just that hybrid role that everyone's going for now and I feel like that's what baseball's turning to it's, it's crazy so 
That's that's incredible because it almost feels like it's it's got to be two different mindsets being a starter and a closer and also probably two different routines. Did you anticipate oh, having the kind of success that you did like almost instantaneously like when you went from starter to closer? Um as like in 2019 or going back to Florida for a second cuz you were named oh, the, oh. the closer of the year for college baseball in your first yeah. season doing it. I'm like that's 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 impressive. I wouldn't say it was a good transition because it took me two years to, to kind of figure it out. You know, I was, I was a good starter in, in high school and then college, you know, freshman year was coming out of the bullpen. Did, like you said, didn't have a routine, didn't really know, like as a starter, you know, you have all that time to prep and um, coming out of the pen, you got to be ready within five pitches, you know? And, and like I said, I had trouble throwing strikes my first year. And then my second year, same thing. It was, it was hard to get in a routine. And then it wasn't until the, the third year I kind of realized that, hey, my my life is going to be in the bullpen here at the University of Florida and I got to figure it out. So that summer I I worked hard at it. And then coming into junior year, I was I was like, all right, I'm going to I'm going to be the best bullpen arm we have here. And uh, just kind of wanted to prove that for myself and for the coaches. And um, so it didn't take me until a couple of years till I till I proved that out um, for myself. But um, I don't think it was an easy transition at all, but it's definitely helped me in pro ball because I can do both now. How like how much going back and forth have you done in pro ball? Like how how much of your time in like the minors and the majors has been starting, and how much has been coming out of the bullpen? Um, so I started from 2016 to 2019. I was a starter with the Giants and the Red Sox and the minors, and then ended up debuting in 19. And I was up all in 19 as a starter. And really logged a bunch of innings, which which was cool. I love the routine behind it, and uh, ended up going down with a blister on my finger. And they kind of want to manage my innings a little bit, so they put me in the bullpen in, in September. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Like I've done that before. And I started throwing a lot harder than I did as a starter that year. And uh, <clears throat> our closer Will Smith ended up getting hurt, and uh, we had a couple other guys coming in the ninth and. Um, didn't do so hot. So I actually went into the office and I was like, Hey, if the ninth is available, I want it tonight. And they're like, okay, you got it. And that night it was one, nothing against the pirates. And I came in in the ninth and uh, got the, got the save. And that was such a cool part of my career because I wanted it. I've done it before and closing in the big leagues, like you said, there's nothing like it. And there's a, definitely a different adrenaline factor than starting and coming out of the bullpen I love that. Dude. and then yeah. and then 20 and then 2020 I was in the bullpen the whole time 2021 bullpen the whole time multiple innings and stuff and and then this offseason I, I worked on a change up I worked on a couple other pitches and then uh coming into spring training I was showcasing them to the Toronto Blue Jays and they wanted me to be a starter and so I ended up starting this year back back again starting for the Blue Jays and uh, just kind of been up and down and now I'm kind of doing the hybrid role where I'm starting for like three innings or I'm coming out of the pen for three innings kind of whatever they need but it's definitely been starting relieving flip-flopping so it's it's cool it's uh, definitely a different routine but I get used to it. No doubt yeah definitely so I, I want to take it back to that debut though in 2019 with San Francisco like what were your emotions like leading up to that and then when you got the call? Um, it was funny because I got the call the day before and I was like, okay, great. Um, and honestly, the giants were awesome. They took care of flying my family over flying, um, like my immediate family over. They just said, send me the birthdays and, and we'll take care of it. So they, I didn't, I, I contacted my parents, obviously they were, they were happy and, and uh, kind of my friends and the Giants took care of everything with them coming over um, and they did a really good job with that. So, um, but then having my whole family there and my friends, that was really cool. So I was like, Oh, are you serious? Like I was all built up. I was ready. Um, I had my routine going and then there was a rain delay and I'm like, Oh, come on, please let the rain go away. You know, I can't, uh, can't have this day pushed back, but ended up, uh, we ended up playing and, uh, I don't know. I was, I was pretty locked in. I think, uh, <clears throat> I think having a routine kind of settles you in a little bit, you know, you, you've done it before, you know, it's, it's the same game. It's just uh, at the higher level. So uh, that was pretty cool. And it wasn't until I uh, 
got up to the plate that I was like, all right, this, this is pretty sweet. Um, cause I, I went two for two, uh, hitting and, uh, I was like, oh, wow, this is, that's, this is pretty cool. Um, so I think, I think the hitting aspect was pretty cool, cooler than the pitching, but obviously throughout the time it, it was pitching, but, um, it was a really cool experience. Um, nothing like it for sure. I was going to say, like, what were your skills with the bat like before that? Because I, I don't think there, you know, he might have broken some record, maybe a Giants record for hits during a, a major league debut. Cause yeah, two for two is pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, we hit a little bit. Um, but I, I, I would say my teammates didn't think I was that good of a hitter. Um, and if you kind of watch that at bat, the first two swings weren't very good. Um, the bat just kind of found the ball and that's how baseball is sometimes, you know, sometimes, sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. And, uh, just uh it's just how baseball goes man it's crazy but it's uh it's awesome because you never know what could happen what was it like throwing to buster posey that was a really cool experience um i ended up throwing to him in uh spring training he was my first bullpen and uh it was funny because it was raining and i don't know if, if i was a little had some nerves going or whatnot and uh he was my first bullpen in spring training and I think maybe if I threw 25 pitches, I think I spiked maybe 18 of them, like right in the dirt. And I'm just like, oh man, this is, this stinks. And I go up to him and I'm like, oh, he's going to, he's going to think I stink, you know? <clears throat> and he comes up to me and just starts talking to me about, you know, pitching in course field and pitching in all these different ballparks and how they play differently. And he was just so mature about it. He was so, uh, so in tune with the game. And then having him in my 2019 season as my rookie, my rookie uh, year, I kind of leaned on him as a uh, pillar of support, just like, hey, like, like, w like, what do you see in here? Like on, on times that I was scuffling and it's like, what, what, would, what would you like to see out of me a little bit more? And uh, he would sit me down after some outings and we would go over the outings and just kind of break down his thoughts on it, my thoughts on it. And we just go back and forth about it. And it was so cool because I mean, he's Buster Posey, you know, and uh, very mature, very uh, just wants to win, you know, and uh, it was cool to see. It was good to have him behind the plate and just, and just trust him, you know, and um, that was, that was a cool experience as well. Yeah. I mean, he's for sure going to be a hall of famer. It's, it's really cool that you had the opportunity to work with him that first year. The other thing that I had a question about with that old Giants team in 19 was how intense is Madison Bumgarner? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he's very intense. He's a, uh, he's a guy who uh, kind of does his own thing. He's uh, very, very in tune with, with what he wants to do and has a plan. And I, I would say I leaned on him as another pillar of support. My, uh, my rookie year, he, uh, I, he always picked on me for sure but I always gave it right back to him because I knew, I knew he liked it. So um, it was good having him in the clubhouse um, just because of he's always shown what he can do on the mound, you know, and, and that's the most respect that, that you can give someone is what they can do on the, on the field. So um, I definitely respected him going into, going into my season and uh, just talked to him about what it took. And uh, he's very in tune with, with winning and uh, just, doing what it takes to win and he knows how to pitch and he knows how to fire some guys up and, and fire himself up. And he's a, he's a strong competitor out there. And um, I respect the heck out of him. Absolutely. I mean that having the, that many guys on that roster with all the world series experience, with all the playoff experience, like when you walked into that clubhouse in that locker room for the first time, could you just sense that like the environment, the atmosphere was one that like, all right, this is a team that that's built to win and guys have been there, done that. Man, that's a good question because I didn't notice until maybe my 2021 career, my 2021 year, I didn't realize the caliber of talent I had on that 2019 and 2020 team until I started going to other teams. Like I had Evan Longoria on that team, Jeff Samarja, Buster Posey, Brandon Crawford, Joe Panic, Brandon Belt. I mean, I had Bruce Bochy as my manager, you know, Will Smith in the pen. It's just so many veterans, so many guys who have been through it, you know, won a World Series. And, oh, man, it's it was cool looking back on, on what I played with and kind of the potential of, of now kind of appreciating who I'm playing with now because, like you said, the, the caliber of talent on that team was was unmatched. And uh, 
it was definitely a blessing, definitely a, a cool experience because those guys were definitely went about their business in a winning, a winning perspective. And uh, just being a part of that showed me how to work and showed me what it was like to be in the big leagues. And uh, I remember there was a bunch of times when I was on the mound and, you know, Crawford would come up to me and just, and just talk to me and uh, just stuff like that. And, and guys saying little things in the clubhouse, you just listen. And uh, you can learn so much from, from just listening to those guys and being present in the moment with them. Um, so that was, yeah, that was a, that was a really good team that we were with. Yeah, no doubt. It, it feels like a great situation for somebody to walk into as a young guy, just like seeing all you know the established guys who can kind of help you through all that. I mean, that, that was amazing. So I was really, really, really wanted to ask you about that. Um, so we mentioned it before, your 2021 was very eventful. Uh, there was a lot of different stops along the way. But I, I'm curious from like the mental aspect of it, like, was it hard finding a rhythm? And was it hard, like, connecting with a group of guys when, you know, you, you spent, I think, how many teams were you on in 2021? Um, up and down, I was with eight, but organizations, I was with five or six in one year. Can you walk yeah. me through, like, what, what was your mindset during that, that very tumultuous season? Oh, man, what a season. It was, it was definitely, it was definitely an eye opener season for me. Um, you know, being with the giants, I had such a, such a good career there, such a fun career and, um, definitely a great place to play. And, and when I got traded over to the twins, um, I was ready for the new opportunity. You know, it's, it's part of the game. I get it. And, uh, there was no hard feelings, obviously. And going to the twins, I had some new expectations and then, uh, just, through all the organizations I was with that year. It was just, it was hard to get on a roll because there'd be times where I wouldn't throw for a week because I was moving to the next team. There was times where I wouldn't throw for two weeks because I was moving to the next team. Some teams were building me up to start. Some teams wanted me to be in the bullpen. So it was just, it was constant up and down of um, different perspectives for each team. Um, but it did make me realize like there's so many factors out of your control in this game. Um, and so many things come unexpected, you know, there's, there's times I was called in the office thinking I was getting called up and it was that I, uh, was going to a different team, you know, and, um, it's just crazy because you build so many, uh, relationships with those guys. And, um, but I found that there's only one thing you can control in this game and, and that's how hard you work, you know, um, with all the unexpected factors and everything, the only thing that you can control is the work you put in at the end of the day, you know, your routine, your attitude and uh, how you are as a person. And that's at the end of the day, that's all you can do. Um, but I did. The good thing about it was I did get to meet. Let's see if, if there's 30 guys, 40 guys on each team times that by eight. That's how many guys I got to meet, you know, and that's such a such a cool experience. And that's kind of what I, the way I looked at it. Each team I was going to, I was still playing baseball, I was still pitching. I was healthy. So I can't complain about that. And then I got to meet, you know, 30 new guys every time I uh, changed teams. And uh, sometimes it was for two weeks, sometimes it was for two months. So um, definitely got to broaden my uh, baseball friendship, you know, got to meet Brian O'Grady, you know, didn't think I'd ever meet him and uh, ended up playing with him with, with the Padres. And uh, I don't know, you, you never know where those relationships take you, but it's definitely cool because now being with the Blue Jays, every away team we go to, whether it was spring training, whether it's during the season, I know at least maybe four guys on the team because I've played with them. You know, I've been with six organizations and, but I mean, I feel like I know someone everywhere we go and, and it's cool because I can go have lunch with them, have breakfast with them. And um, just the relationships I've built with, with all the guys I've been around. It's, it's definitely, definitely a blessing in disguise with how my year went. But that was that was the best takeaway is is the people I got to meet. I like the, yeah, I, I like the I like the positive out, outlook on that. Were teams understanding of like your situation, being on so many different teams and not having a consistent routine? Where did you feel like they give you a fair shake when it came to like opportunities? Where, where you mentioned it's like, hey, I'll, I'm like a week between starts or a week between outings. Where, do you think teams were understanding of that? I don't know. You know, that's a, that's a good question. I remember when I went to the Orioles. Um, and uh, I went from Texas to Baltimore and Texas was building me up and we had a couple rainouts and I got to Baltimore and I actually hadn't faced a hitter in maybe four weeks, about a month. 
and I go into the office. He's like, hey, when, when was the last time you faced a hitter? I was like, ah, I don't know, maybe about a month ago. He's like, are you ready to pitch tonight? And I'm like, absolutely. I was just itching to get back. So, I mean, whether whether they knew that that the up and down is what it is, at the end of the day, you have to compete and you have to get out. So, I mean, I can you can make all the excuses in the world, but no one's going to care. You know, at the end of the day, you have to bear down, throw strikes, get outs, and try to win. And that's what it comes down to. So everywhere I went, you can't really complain about what's going on because no one cares. You know, you have to suck it up and just grind and compete. And at the end of the day, that's all it takes. So whether they understood it or not, it doesn't matter. You, it, I don't really care. You just have to have to win. So it is what it is. Absolutely. So you mentioned the Orioles. I'm an, I'm an Orioles fan. And I rem- actually remember when they, they brought you over last summer. Um, you know, we, we talk all the time about leaders in the clubhouse, and we've even talked about it in this conversation. But, like, when you stepped into Baltimore and, and you saw what Trey Mancini had, and the gang had going on over there, like, could you sense, like, Trey's leadership when you got in there? Yeah. Um, it was cool having, having Trey in, in, the, in the clubhouse. You know, he definitely led by example. Um, John Means was another one, pitcher. Um, and there's definitely a lot of young guys there. You know, Cedric Mullins had a great year. And um, I'd say those guys just kind of lead by example. It, it's it's hard with uh, the season they had. It's hard to kind of stay positive, you know, rightfully so. I mean, any team who, who's kind of scuffling, it's hard to be there. But, uh, um, you know, they, they went about their business. They worked hard. You know, Trey grinded out at bats. And, I mean, he, he was fun to watch. You know, he – he could hit a ball out opposite field or he can pull it. And, and he was in tune with the game and uh, um, he was, he was two lockers over from me. So he was, he was cool to talk to. And uh, I'm happy he's getting a chance with, with uh, the Astros. That's cool to see. Um, and it's tough to see Mancini out for the year because he was a phenomenal pitcher. Um, the business he, he went about in his bullpen was fun to watch. And uh yeah, just seeing people's routines was, was cool too throughout the year and uh, getting to pick their brains about it. But uh, but yeah, it was it was cool to have them in the clubhouse and uh, I think leading by example is good. You know, you, you got to see how the, how they uh, act on the field and, and go about their business. So to see the Orioles this year compared to when you saw them last year, did you have any idea that they would be able to to have this drastic of a turnaround? <clears throat> what a turnaround! That's it makes the Orioles fun to watch too. You know, I'll still, I'll still go back on on the apps and and watch the games from, from my old teams and seeing what the Orioles are doing now. I mean, it was kind of, it was kind of coming. You could tell last year, you know, they were picking up guys who had potential to be, to be really good. And uh, just seeing, seeing them produce with, uh, with the team they have, you could tell they're having fun. You could tell their, uh, their team camaraderie is there. And I think that's what it takes to win, you know, having a team who, who all pull for each other and kind of, I don't know. They're just, they're just having fun. And you can tell teams who have fun and teams who want to win and, and pull for each other to win who aren't selfish. Those are the teams that start winning. And uh, I mean, you could see it up and I could see it up and coming last year. And then uh, they're pulling it together this year and you could tell they kind of have some swagger now and they're, they're building kind of more wins, more wins, and they're just having fun and, they're just like, why not us, you know? So, um, I mean, I think everyone could see it, and I don't think anyone expected it, but they're pulling it together, and they, they got a pretty good team over there. It's been the most fun to watch this year in, in, in probably five years. Yeah, it's just – Yeah, really, being an Orioles fan, what do you think? It's I didn't see this coming. I mean, but, like, I, I could see that, like, when they called Adley up, there was, like, a night and day difference of – with the team before Adley and after him, like it's crazy to think that like one player, like a position player could have that kind of an impact. But I mean, I can't think of any other reason why. I mean, they're playing fast and loose and they're loving life now. Yeah. It's, it's funny you mentioned Adley. I, I never got to meet him, but I did see that he was a top prospect coming up and the games I've watched his passion behind the plate. When someone gets a big time strikeout or, um, you know, just just closes out the game or something, the passion he has for winning. That's the biggest thing I've noticed about him. You know, I don't, I don't really watch a lot of Orioles games. I'll just see some highlights of them closing it out or whatnot on Instagram. But the passion I ha- that he, that I see from him, you know, the fist pump when, when pitchers get big timeouts, it kind of shows that, you know, he's in tune with the game. He wants to win too, and that's what you need behind the plate and a guy who, who pulls for his pitchers like that. So 
it, it's funny you mentioned Adley. That's that's one thing I noticed about him. But yeah, it's well. I mean, for your perspective too, playing with Buster Posey, like you you've seen the impact like a dominant catcher can have on Absolutely. a team. Absolutely. Like, are were you just were you getting like those kind of vibes when you're thinking about Adley Rutschman? Like they're building it the right way with a franchise catcher like him. I think catchers make a huge, huge impact on uh, on the pitching staff. You know, I, not only Buster Posey, but I got the opportunity to throw to Stephen Vogt um, in 2019. You know, it was either Buster Posey or Stephen Vogt, and I was happy with either of them, you know, because the passion that both of them had, it was catching, you know, and, and pulling for your pitchers, knowing the game, and just having that trust behind the plate is such a, such a big difference than, than any other catcher, you know, having a leader and uh, – you know, Buster Posey, um, Stephen Vogt, those were leaders in the clubhouse and leaders behind the plate, you know, and they dominated the uh, the field as far as making sure everyone was in order and made sure the pitchers were in order. You know, they, they held the pitchers responsible. And uh, um, I haven't seen much of much of Adley, but uh, for, for his rankings and, and how he's holding up the, uh, the Orioles bullpen, I mean, I mean, you could compare the two, you know, but uh, there's no one like Buster Posey, so it's hard to it's hard to say. I love that. All right, we'll do a couple quick rapid fire questions, and I'll let you run. Thank you so much for hopping on here this morning. It's Absolutely. Man. Um. So, what is your walkout song, and what is your story behind it? Um. So I actually have two. My my walkout song when when I'm in the big leagues is "Push It" by Rick Ross. Um. There's I don't know. There's something about Rick Ross's. Uh, voice that kind of gets me going and then in the, in the beginning of that song it, it talks about being in Miami and uh kind of just a tribute to where I'm from you know being from Miami so so that's kind of cool so I like that song and then um the song I've been rocking with now is Satisfied by Revolution I think it's it's a good vibe and uh I don't know I, I like Revolution a lot and uh yeah so I just picked that one I dig it yeah so I mean from your perspective a firsthand experience which ballparks would you consider to be the most pitcher friendly and which would you consider to be the most hitter friendly? Ooh. Pitcher friendly, I got to say Oracle in 2019 when the fences in center were kind of deep because I know there was a ton of balls that were hit deep center that were caught right at the track. And I was like, okay, nice. <laughs> but now that they moved it in, those are homers now. So, um, but I, I just love pitching at home at Oracle. The fan base was awesome. So I would say that was a pitcher park for me. And then a hitter friendly park. Oh, let's see. Uh, I would have to say San Diego, just because I don't know. There's something about when they got hot, those balls were flying out of the stadium. So. Um, whether it's hitter friendly or not, I think the fan base in San Diego was, was electric too for their team. So playing against them and playing with them was kind of a cool experience because when that crowd got going, the bats got going. So, and you know, the whole slam Diego. So (laughs) yeah, there's definitely some, some hitters there. So, um, I think, I think the hitters have a lot to do with it too, but, uh, I'd say San Diego. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I yeah. wouldn't even like. It's not really one that you would think to be like, oh, like hitter friendly. But I could see that. Yeah, I mean that's. Yeah. That definitely. Yeah, plays. I mean Arizona. The Arizona. Oh no, Colorado. Sorry, Colorado is definitely hitter friendly. Um, that something something with the air there. Uh, it's crazy. I remember one start I had. I gave up like four, and I was like, oh man. And then we scored five right away, and I was like, oh shoot, all right. Then I gave up another two, and I'm like, dang. And then we scored another four, and I was like, "Oh, this game, this game goes up and down so fast in Colorado, just because the jet stream that goes out to center and the high elevation." That was definitely definitely hitter friendly. I, I don't know how I forgot about that one. <laughs> what did you think about pitching in Camden Yards before they moved the wall uh, back? Um, I haven't pitched in it since they they moved the wall in. They moved the wall in, right? Yeah. Or, that- what did they do in left? They, 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 the they pushed it back 30 feet, I think, and they made it like 10 feet higher. But like you were there like with the OG like setup, right? So I mean you saw Yeah. Left field. So they moved it back. Yeah. And they, they built a wall. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think left field, uh left field was kind of played uh played short, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that for sure. Um I got my first win actually in Camden Yards with the Giants. And uh I think I gave up a homer and left. 
And then my debut with the Orioles this year or last year, I gave up a homer to left too. That was like a wall scraper. So, but then again, when, when you get it, you get it. So I didn't really notice it playing, playing so short and I didn't really pitch there that long of a career to really know the difference. But um, yeah, I don't, I still think Colorado is, is a, is a hitter friendly park. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would buy that. Yeah. Every game it's, it, you feel like you play there. It's like a big 10 football game. It's like low double digits every time I feel like, um, as far as in Colorado. Yeah. I, I just feel yeah, like every not, game that's played there is like 10 to eight. <laughs> yeah. But like your pitches don't move, your pitches don't move the same either. It's like they stay up, you know, everything moves side to side rather than up and down. So like sinkers and changeups are just like floaters and then like curveballs are just like spinning. It's, it's crazy but like you just have to get your sights down and it's a definitely a different pitching perspective there. It's, it's, it's wacky, but yeah, no doubt. So I, we, we I just mentioned a little college football. I'm a big college football fan. Do you, do you keep up with the Gators or are you a proud Gator football fan? I would say I'm a Gator football fan. If someone had to label me, like if I'm going to watch, if there's, if someone's going to ask me, who's your team, I'm going to have to say Gators. I don't watch a lot of college football. Um, I watch more NFL just for fantasy reasons, um, but I've always been baseball. I've always been into baseball. I watch a ton of baseball. Um, I just, I love the game. I think there's so much to learn from it. And uh, all my time is spent watching baseball rather than college football or, or, or NFL. So um, can't really say I'm a huge college football fan, but um, I'd have to say the Gators. Is MLB Network on at your house 24-7? <laughs> Man, I, I would come home. My phone's got a game going. My iPad's got a game going, and the team and the TV's got a game going. And if someone struck out the side, I'm rewatching striking out the side because I think there's an art with striking out the side. So um, I don't know. I think uh, I, I like the game and uh, the rivalries that come with it. And uh, I think there's a lot of fun players to watch and a lot of fun pitchers to watch. And uh, um, it's cool where the game's going, and and it's definitely changing. And uh, it's fun to watch. I feel like this season more so than any other has, has been more fun from a fan's perspective, just because of all the new teams, the new storylines. Like I was watching Mets Dodgers last night and that felt like a playoff game in you know late August. And I'm like, this is a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. And the, and that's what it might be. You know, that's what it might come down to. And, and that's what's, that's, what's fun. They know what's at hand and what they have to prove and, and how they want to play. And, um, what the Mets are doing this year is is unbelievable, and it's it's fun to watch the Mets and uh, um, have some former teammates on there who are fun to watch, and like Pete Alonso, and uh, yeah, it's like you said, it's it's a playoff atmosphere, and that's what it is now. I mean, so many teams are close, and uh, a lot of teams are good this year, so it'll it'll be fun to watch what what it looks like down the stretch. Yeah, it's it's so much fun. All right, I have one last question for you. What's the best yeah. piece of advice you've ever received? ever received um <clears throat> i would say in 2019 i received a piece of advice and it was um like do always do what's best for your career you know i think i think a lot of people have things to say throughout your career which rightfully so you know might be helpful but at the end of the day it's your career um, and you have to be okay with how it goes and you have to be selfish. You have to be selfish in your career, not as, not as a teammate, but as far as like doing what it takes to, to make sure you can win, you know, whatever it is. And you have to be selfish. You have to, um, you know, and, and I think that goes with like your time, you know, you have to be selfish with your time and, uh, just do whatever it takes to win for yourself. And, um, I would say, I would say that was the best advice. And I'd say the best advice I could give to someone was uh, what I said earlier is the only thing you can control this game is how hard you work. And I think that goes a long way. Those are, those are both yeah. great pieces of advice. That's, that's fantastic. Well, dude, this has been incredible. Uh, best of luck the rest of this year. Uh, you know, and we'll have to get you back on when, when Brian gets done playing in Japan here in a couple months. Yeah, for sure. I'd love to hear his, uh, his experience on Japan. You know, it, it was cool to see him go over there and, uh, um, I was happy for him for sure. And, uh, hopefully he's doing well. So I appreciate you having me on Justin. It's been fun.